Well, hi, this is Joanne Ray with Senior Marketing Specialist, and this is A Human Connection. I've been so extraordinarily blessed over the course of my career to meet some fascinating and super successful people, and now I get to bring those conversations to you. So I hope you enjoy, I hope you listen, and I hope we can learn along the way together. All right. Well, hey, guys, welcome back to another edition of A Human Connection. Um, today, I am honored to have as my guest one of the hardest working. Uh, he can outwork, outcompete, uh, outperform any agent that we've ever, ever had a, a pleasure of working with. This is Jacob Norp, um, CEO of Senior Insurance Specialists in Joplin, Missouri. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning, Joanne. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So this will be fun. We'll just have a conversation like we've done uh, many times over the course of the years um, that we've known each other and worked together. But for everybody listening today, why don't you give just a quick little background and bio of, of how you did get started and, and how long you've been in the business, Jake? Okay, yeah. So um, I got started because really my dad was in the insurance business and um when I turned 18, I'd been with him on several appointments and he always told me, every time I bring you, I always make a sale. <laughs> so, uh, you were a good think, tool, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think I provided a little human interest in the <laughs> insurance process and he like probably was glad to, to have a child there to where, you know, somebody thought, well, hey, if I buy a policy, then maybe I'm helping him feed his kid, you know? Yeah. Or something he, like must, that. he must be a nice guy. He's bringing yeah. his kid. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So that was it was neat uh, to be able to be with him and watch him <laughs> in his laid back manner, talk to people about insurance. And uh, so he was inspiring to me to get in the business. And I went to college and, you know, got a marketing management degree. But when I graduated, I'd already been working for four years in the business. Uh, I started when I was 18. And so I thought, I'm not going to I'm not going to go work, you know, for a corporation right now. I'm going to, I love what I'm doing and I'm just going to keep right on doing it. So, plus, I think I might have uh, taken a pay cut uh, starting <laughs> to work for somebody else, working part time, you know, as a college student. So, uh, you know, it, it was uh, uh, a good deal for me to continue yeah. on. So, yeah. So I'm curious, Jacob, do you know what it was that your was what was the epiphany that your dad had that went from truck driver to insurance? Had you ever asked him that? Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I think I uh, heard that the other day it was for the first time. My stepmother was telling the story where she had the idea that insurance might be good for dad. The family had been in the oil company slash filling station yep. business and cafes. And so she really had a strong feeling like he ought to do that. And so he got his license and worked as a captive agent for a little while and then worked, started as an independent agent. And so. That's uh, awesome. So we all, we owe it all to mom, right? Yep. Yep. Going all the way back. Your, your grandma. So, That's yeah. awesome. so, so go, go all the way fast forward then when you joined the business, did you work with your dad? Cause I don't think I ever had the pleasure of meeting your dad that I can remember, but did you work side by side with each other first or did he leave and just handed it over to you? Yeah, no, um, he had a uh, small out of his house. And so when I was 18 and jumped in the business, that's what I was doing. I was um, basically looking in the phone book and seeing who had older sounding names. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, doing dialing and then uh, door to door and things like that. And so uh, he went on his appointments. I went on my appointments. And so um, at some point he ended up retiring. And then that's when I started my insurance agency, Jacob North Insurance Agency. Ah, and then later, okay. So they were separate, two uh -huh. different entities. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, I worked through his agency for probably four years while I went to college. And then uh, after that, I started uh, just called it Jacob North Insurance Agency and then later yeah. Senior Insurance Specialist. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and always in the Joplin area, correct? And yes. then I know you've expanded your actual footprint into some of the other states, but walk through maybe some of those um, processes or some of those decisions that you made in order to be able to kind of hire that first person in your office and then be able then because of that, probably, I would assume, 
uh, then be able to maybe expand a little bit. So walk us through about how far into the business that was for you and what were those processes you went through to make those, make those decisions? Yeah, well, I had the office out of my uh, house for a good while. I would guess and say maybe seven or eight years. Um, we started having okay. some children. We have four girls and three boys. So uh, we have a great family. Good, good. We're uh, gonna we're gonna get name. to that. I want to I want to hear all about these four girls, three boys. Okay. <laughs> but uh, so we started having some children, and the office in the house started uh, being kind of interesting. So I would have <laughs> uh, my oldest kids coming in as two and three year olds while I'm talking on the phone and wanting to play with oh. daddy and. And, yeah. uh, you know, they didn't understand that I couldn't do that. And so kind of made me feel sad that I, you know, couldn't do that as well. So my wife and I started thinking, I think it might be better if we actually have an office that you go to. And then when you come <laughs> home, the kids have your undivided, undivided attention yeah. to where. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I ended up just buying yeah. a building in Joplin. And uh, the other reason was I knew I needed help me answer phones and, you know, do great customer service because when you come home for lunch and you have 10 phone calls to try to answer and come home for dinner and have another yeah. 10, it, uh, you know, we didn't really have cell phones back then. Uh, it's kind yeah. of scary, but. <laughs> I know, so, I know to think of a world without cell phones, right? How did we, how did we operate? <laughs> yeah. So people just had to wait on me and I yeah. didn't really like that. You know, I thought, oh my gosh, I need somebody you know, to really help people out. So that was yeah. the decision making process to, to get a building and uh, to hire someone, you know, to help. And so we did that about seven. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty good process. We, we like to teach around here, you know, cause we see agents at every point of their career, every point of the journey of their entire career, just starting out, thinking about going from their car or kitchen table to an office, and then thinking about buying a building, and then thinking about hiring that first person to assist you with everything, then doing that first agent, maybe getting into that part of the, the business. So it's super fun for us, and I think it'll be awesome for other agents to hear your story that it took seven years uh, to, yeah. to get to the point where it was, I really need some assistance. I really need some additional help. Um, I need a place for customers to come see me. Um, and that's funny to think about now. Isn't it funny to think about, Jake, that you were working from home or working remote, you know, long before everybody was trying to figure it out a couple of years ago. Um, and we didn't have, you didn't have any of the technologies, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Right. that we had in 2020 when everybody was working remote. Um, so I'm sure that was a big adjustment. Um, but I love your wife's analogy of, you know, it's not quality of time, it's quantity of time that we always talk about as parents. Uh, just because you're there all day didn't mean that you could give them the attention that they wanted and needed and you wanted. So going away, going out of the office, getting the work done, coming home to where you could devote all your time to them. I think that's a super important story that that will resonate with a lot of people, too, because I know that's a big wrestle that we all have, no matter where you're at in, in parenting or in your career, when you're blending the two and trying to figure out your time. That's the biggest question that gets asked of every mother, every father, every successful person gets asked, how do you balance your time? How do you balance, you have seven children and now one grandchild, right? Or two, yeah. one. Yeah, one. one. And, and that's the most important thing in your world, but yet, you know, the business is what provides for mm -hmm. those the for those children and 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 the, the travel that you get to do. I wanna talk about that too. You've got some great travel stories, I know. Um, so it is a weird, odd, very difficult balance. Um, but how do you, other than that, that, that first move, how on earth do you work? Cause I know the hours you work. I know the work you put in, how do you do that and manage to be the father and now grandfather that you are? Yeah. So, um, got some good ways that have really helped out and, you know, at the start, I wasn't as busy. So I would take Fridays off and, uh, maybe, you know, then I went to Friday afternoons 
I, at one season, I took Wednesdays off and you try to experiment with your schedule, yeah. you know, for best results. And of course, the ages of your kids, yeah. uh, it really matters, you know, on, on the amount of time you spend with them. Um, we try to take a lot of vacations and uh, of course, insurance conventions can turn into yeah. family vacations pretty easily. Yeah. Uh, so in fact, you know, I've taken my kids to, to SMS retreats. Yeah, I love I, that. Yeah, and, and they, love, they, they still talk about it. Oh, that's uh, awesome. So I know you do something the, special and I forget what age it is. I forget what age it is, but I know you do something special for each of your children when they when they would hit a certain age. Tell us about that. Sure, sure. So when the kids would turn seven, each one of them, uh, I would take them to Disney World. Uh, my wife homeschools our kids and has always done that. She uh, was a teacher. And so when our oldest daughter, Brianna, turned five, she decided she'd stay home and, and homeschool the kids. So that's been a really neat thing for our family. Uh, but um, yeah, so when they turn seven, uh, since the kids always get to spend, you know, more time with mom than they do dad. So I would do something special and we just had a blast. Each one of the kids, I always took them to Disney World. We'd stay there for four or five days, hit all the parks. The girls loved going to Bibbidi Boppity Boutique. <laughs> of course, uh, you know, get their hair done and go walk around in uh, the fun dresses, you know, with the oh. I've so just had a blast doing that. It was just you and that child once they turned uh -huh. seven, just the two of you. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. So many of them that are, are that are older than that now, I bet that still just has to be one of the most precious memories they have of their childhood, right? Yeah, they had a blast. And I'd do a picture book for them and write in it, you know, what we did each day. And, and oh. uh, so it was a special time for me, for sure. Uh, I was number six uh, in our family. And so we had a big family. But my next sibling was seven years older than me. And so there was five girls. And so sometimes I felt like an only child. And uh, yeah. so just having a good amount of children has really been a blessing to me too. And then when they turn 16, 17, I try to do something special with them as well. And usually it involves an insurance convention. So <laughs> I'm excited to take Abigail somewhere this year. So we qualify oh. for, for a convention. Oh, does she get, Abigail's the one that gets to go uh, this year? Yeah. yeah. How, old, how old is she? She's 16? Uh, she is 17. Yeah. Oh, oh, how fun. Oh, I'm anxious to meet her. That's incredible. Yeah, we've talked a lot of times over the years that we're literally in the most incredibly blessed career we could ever be in. What what you get to do daily is sit with some of the most important people in your community and help them make sure they have the right health care and financial decisions made so that when anything would happen, that, that they're safe. And then we're rewarded in ways that is sometimes almost, you know, an, an embarrassment of, of yeah. things. When we were going through 2020 and just the COVID and the lockdown and the so much stress in the world and so much um, almost hatred of people toward their job. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that we've always just kind of taken for granted, I guess. This is the only career I've ever had. I started right out of college. And uh, it's the only industry. I worked in real estate for a smidge as I went through um, college at Kirksville. But so it's the only industry I really know either. And I just, I guess, assumed that everybody lives, gets to live this life of this having an impact, but also being able to travel the world with our friends and partners and carriers and, and our own agencies. And, and it's just been absolutely amazing. Some of the places that we've gotten to go and just the amazing blessing that we have of being in this industry. If you didn't know that before 2020, I hope to God everybody learned that post 2020 that, you know, when so many businesses were hurting or, or locking up shop or couldn't keep employees you know, our industry was thriving because our people still needed us. Our customers still needed us. And we were able to to pivot and shift to being remote and being still accessible to your clients the or your customer, the client, our customer, which is you. Um, we were able to still, you know, conduct business on a day-to-day -day manner. So it's, it, it yeah. is a pretty, pretty incredible 
blessing for all of us for sure. Definitely. And well, so let's, uh, let, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I definitely need to give a shout out to our team here at senior. Yeah. Inspector. So yeah. Tracy talk about was, 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 was Tracy your first hire or she's just, I know she's been there the longest. I think third. Okay. Um, so we had some, uh, you know, good employees before yeah. her, but she's definitely been here the longest. She's been here 18 years. She and, is. Uh, just Amazing. done a great job. She's assembled a great team. She's a good leader here at the office and uh, definitely couldn't have done any of this without her. She's here on a daily basis yeah. and um, just slugging it out, you know, uh, with the rest of us and, and uh, doing a great job, uh, you know, with customer service that she wears. I think what you found in Tracy is what I've been blessed to find in, in our employees as well, which is that magical intersection of a person who has the strengths and expertise to do very well at their job and the heart and the, 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 the heart to care about what they're doing and who they're doing it with, whether it be with you or with the, the, the customers. And that's, that's a beautiful intersection of a of a person, but of an employee. Definitely, Tracy fits that model, like like all of our employees here too. But that's that's not something you find every day, as you know. You could have one, you could have the most caring, wonderful individual who would love your clients. Maybe not the best on on like you said, the leadership qualities and the expertise and the processing and the systems and everything. Or you can have one that's really good at that but is more robotic and treats it like a job versus, you know, an opportunity to help somebody. So, so kudos to you for, for finding Tracy and, and enabling her too. And you've empowered her to do that as well. You've empowered her to continue to grow and, and uh, we love the heck out of her and enjoy working with her over the years too. And Jennifer and Emily are doing a great job as well. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we, we love our team. And uh, we do a lot more with our smaller team than uh, we might do with a lot of people that, like, as you said, doesn't really care as much about what they do. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I teased in the in introducing you that you could you probably outwork, outperform, outsell anybody that we've ever worked with. And, and I know you're always gracious enough to say it's it's the team and it is. So so walk us through. I think most people would probably be shocked to know how many people your office sees on a typical week. And then during AEP, how many people your office sees? I think people are going to if they're listening on their phone, they'll probably drop their phone when they hear some of your numbers. But walk us through as much as you want to share uh, on that, Jacob. OK. Um, yeah, we still see people face to face. And so uh, that kind of feels like we're a dinosaur lumbering around in a, in a, in the new world or something. Uh, but, uh, you know, and most of the folks that are there are, um, you know, in a call center, maybe, or, um, you know, just coming through town and helping people out uh, and then going back to their town. But so. Uh, we still see pay people face to face. Uh, we own our buildings still. We switched buildings a couple times, um, but uh, probably face to face, we would see maybe 60, 70 people a week that come come into our office uh, until an annual enrollment. Uh, maybe 100 people a week, but uh, an annual enrollment <clears throat> we usually see around 100 people a day. So uh, it ends up being, I think last year was 35. You know, we had the face shields on and everything. I think we saw 3,700. It was our biggest face to face meeting with people. So that shows you oh that God, you, you, you cut out there for just a second. I okay. want to make sure that, that we, that we, everybody hears those numbers. So even during 2020, wearing face shields and masks and everybody living the way we were living, uh, that first year of COVID, uh, you saw over 3,700 people in your office that uh -huh. day. That, that and no day. one got COVID. I was totally ah. amazed. So I give the uh, glory to the good Lord for that. But absolutely, uh, Joplin yeah. must have been protected. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so. Ah. But uh, yeah, so that also shows you that the seniors in our area were weren't all that scared of it. Yeah. So yeah. that's probably just the Midwest. 
It, I, we definitely saw it was a geographical thing for sure, as far as how people felt about it, um, the cases, you know, of, of people actually getting sick and, and even worse, uh, definitely, you know, it was area by area. So we always, we were here to support our agents because we work with agents across the country and, you know, downtown Chicago, upstate New York and Joplin, mm -hmm. Missouri, and, you know, rural Missouri, right outside our hometown here. So everybody, we had to be open to make sure that we understood whatever that agent needed, we could deliver. So if it was still face-to-face, -face, we could help figure out a way you could still do that as, as safely as possible. Uh, we had like some agencies do like drive-in or drive-through service where, you know, a customer stayed in their car. I think maybe you had some of those too. Yeah, where we, you did, like ran... we did some of that too. When yeah, you ran out. information out to their car and back. Yeah. So again, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier of, the business who's, businesses who were able to survive 2020 and really any kind of roadblock, that was the biggest we've all ever faced, but any kind of obstacle or roadblock, it's how you're able to pivot your business and how you're able to still meet your customer where they need to be met, but it's not going to look like it's always looked. And I think that's probably one of the biggest success stories of our industry and of agents like yourself who were able to still say, my clients still need me. This is still the enrollment period. They still need me to give the same amount of service. We just got, it may look a little different. Um, so kudos to you guys. And with those kind of numbers, obviously it takes a team, it takes a village, it takes a very smooth process and systems, being able to use things like, you know, the technologies that were, that have been made so much better over the last few years um, to, to be able to see that many people and process that many applications. But you guys have had, uh, I'm sure, a learning curve over the years of all the different technologies and processes that have been thrown your way. But I know, again, that's probably where Tracy shines and her team of really understanding, digging in. I know our team work daily, you know, getting anything set up um, with with your team and making sure that you have everything that you need, but that's awesome. Yeah, and those numbers are absolutely incredible. Um, so let's go back a little bit to um, the family side of things. Yeah. So this is a human connection. So as humans, uh, we like to talk, we met through business and, and a lot of the people listening want to know about your business today, but what this whole podcast and this whole conversation, these all these conversations are about is listening to people who have had tremendous success in their life like yourself, but bringing the human aspect to the table. So, so you and your wife got married, started having babies, had seven children. She homeschooled them all. <laughs> incredible first of all um but uh you talked a little bit about some of the the trips that you like to take one-on-one -on -one. tell us a little bit about some of your family vacations too because i know you've had some great uh taking the whole family what is it like to take nine people uh <laughs> each each having at least one suitcase uh on a trip somewhere yeah yeah it's definitely you kind of become you put on your travel agent hat <laughs> and try to, you know, especially if you go out of the country, you've got to really have things set up before you go. But yeah, so again, for listeners, just let me back up. So most people who had seven kids would probably never leave the house, number one, or their their travel or vacations might be to the next town over. Jacob not only traveled with all of his children, he actually took them out of the country <laughs> more than once. So yes, you, you guys are very, very, very adventurous. Adventurous or crazy, who knows what <laughs> Adventurous. <laughs> but uh we started of course we you know you have to have a 12 passenger van and then 15 passenger van things like that but <laughs> i remember uh when we were getting started seeing all the national parks that we've seen i think we've seen uh in the 40s maybe national oh parks. that's incredible <clears throat> all piled in the van and then uh, we had a travel trailer uh, or actually we had a box trailer on our first trip. We just put everybody's bicycles in there and put all of our luggage in there and headed out. My mom went with us, our dog went with us. And so we actually had 10 people and our dog oh, traveling didn't around. You bring a, didn't you bring another pet too besides the dog? Is oh yeah, a... we stopped. We ended up at one point, we got a lizard, uh, <laughs> yeah, lizard with us. And uh, I think my oldest daughter brought her gerbil. So. <laughs> Because yeah, they kids. couldn't stay home alone, or why bring right. this? <laughs> <laughs> well, and the kids can't part with their pets. 
Oh and, my gosh. Uh, and then our son fell in love with a lizard one time, so we, <laughs> we bought a lizard. So we, of course. Once we figured out how much crickets you had to feed it once we got home and had this special light and all that. We I, I have been through, through that. that. Yes, I've been through that as well. My daughter went through a phase, not a phase, like her entire childhood. She loved any kind of animal she could, that we would possibly allow for her to have. So when she was little, it was whatever would fit in a cage. Like, I don't want, you know, let's not start with dogs and cats and rabbits and everything that might be running around. Let's start with something that f- can fit in a cage. So she did the lizard route. And so we would go to to PetSmart, I think once a week and buy live crickets and figure out how to feed this, how to get them home and get them in the cage. And, yeah. uh, but I would never take them on vacation with me. So you're yeah. definitely adventurous for that. So, uh, you know, and, and my wife and I both grew up poor. My parents were poor. And so just getting to get out and get out of town and have some fun. It's, that's a big adventure. I remember when I was growing up, um, just to tell you how poor we were, this is not supposed to be a comedy or anything, but, uh, I remember wearing cowboy boots, even though I didn't really like the way they uh, fit on my feet, so that my pants, I was growing tall very quickly in junior high, so that my pants didn't go up and show my hairy legs. So I would wear wear (laughs) cowboy boots just because my pants, we didn't have enough money to buy pants that were long enough as a girl. So, yep. so uh, my, so. I relate very well. My story to that is I grew up very similar on a farm. Definitely no money's no money for anything that wasn't necessary. That was always the big word in our house. And I also grew very tall, very fast. And so my parents weren't going to buy me new jeans all the time. So my mom would literally sew. Um, she'd cut old jeans for my brothers or something and take the denim and sew like a another inch and a half around the bottom and she thought she was being so sweet because she would do like embroidery and put flowers and maybe when I was little little I thought that was cute but that went all the way into my teens and I was not not having it at all (laughs) so I I can relate to that (laughs) so uh but yeah we we got a chance to um you know go out west several times we're taking vans and then we got the pool travel trailers and had a lot of fun doing that. And then um, we had a period of about five years where we uh, started getting into RV traveling. And oh uh, my gosh. so we had a lot of fun doing it with uh, an RV. And then we got, that was a gas RV, our first one. I think it was about 30 foot. And then we got a diesel 40 foot. And so, <clears throat> I mean, driving one of those things around the national parks and up hills and. Oh my gosh. Wild times. Oh, more power to you. I just don't think I could do that. Uh, funny but story. That's... We uh, we ended up getting off trail in New York City, and we oh actually drove through Harlem in our RV on a Friday night. <laughs> so, <laughs> it almost reminded me of the movie Vacation, where Vacation, Jeff yeah, was, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get off in the same wrong part of St. Louis. <laughs> so you, didn't stop party, ask for, you didn't stop and ask oh, for directions, did you? Nope. Nope. People partying in the streets on a Friday night, you know, oh, I love it. and, I and love we're, it. we're trying to part the crowd driving through. So <laughs> thankfully, here's these, here's these rednecks from Missouri yeah. coming through town. <laughs> oh, you know what? It was, oh, it was pretty it. funny. A little nervous, you know, oh, but, I love uh, it. got out of there. And then, then, uh, you know, when you drive one of those things too, they're 13 and a half foot tall. So you got to New York city's not really made for those with the bridges. And so we actually had at one point getting out of there, we had to have a tow truck come and stop traffic across <laughs> one, across one of the roads so we could uh, get going the right way and, and get out of there where the bridges were so low. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we had a, great, oh. a lot of fun stories. Of course, at those times you're pretty, you know, pretty stressed out. And, I was going to say, you're laughing now, but I bet you and your wife probably were not laughing at that time. <laughs> Kids will have some great stories. They'll know what not to do on vacation. And what oh, was. Real, yeah, exactly. Oh, I bet they thought it was hilarious, probably. Yeah. Or they yeah. were embarrassed, you know, depending <laughs> on the age, you know, usually embarrassed about anything we do for a certain part of their life. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. So you so what you took them out of the country. Where where did you guys go? 
Yeah, but so uh, one of the insurance companies was having a convention in Ireland. So I think one of the kids' very favorite vacations is uh, where we flew to Greece. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we flew to Spain and we got we went on a Mediterranean cruise, mm. and so that was nice. Went over yeah. uh, even to um, Israel area, and uh, so we went. We got back to Greece, flew to London. We got on the um, all the subway systems in yeah. London. We had to have yeah. the buddy system, and uh, you know, this is I all remember, family. This is all family. nine yeah. of you. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. what's the what's the age span? Like, is there ten years between first and seventh, or how many years? Um... Oldest is twenty four, and youngest is thirteen. So we okay. had them about every two years. Some okay. a little faster, some a little longer. But... So the buddy system was youngest go with the oldest, and then work your way down yeah. that way, I or because I had to carry my youngest son at the time, and so. Uh, and then um, Renee took the next youngest, and then okay. our oldest took number three. From they the, would divide that up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That way, oh, we had to run fast, like we would have to do every once in a while to get on board on a subway. You know, <laughs> hey, we left no child behind. So. No, I was going to say the the good news is this, this, this does have a happy ending, folks. He never lost a child in Ireland, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even oh, the subways of London. So that was our most challenging time. That was when I was a little bit nervous, just making sure we didn't leave yeah. somebody at a subway yeah. station. Yeah, yeah. Traveling anywhere with any amount of small children is is there's always so many things that you worry about. And you're probably always counting. I'm I always yeah. do that when I have my whole group. Uh, you know, is everybody counting off and making sure we didn't lose anybody? Oh my gosh. And so you raised them all. Pretty much without cell phones, probably, or I guess the the youngest yeah. ones probably now they've all had cell phones most of their yeah. life. But isn't it funny to think about? You know, we talked about in business that it's so funny to think about a life before all this technology and cell phones. Think about parenting. Like think about us growing up. We would, you know, sounds like we grew up very similarly. I would get on my bike. We lived in the country, and I would still just yeah. get on my bike and go to town, which was at least eight miles away. And meet my friend there who lived in another town and she would drive about or she would ride her bike like seven miles to meet. We didn't have a cell phone, a helmet. We would put my best friend actually put like a, a boom box uh, <laughs> on the front of her bike and then use like bungee cords or something to to tie it, to keep it on there. And That's awesome. my parents just had to assume that we got there. We got there safely. That we're going to be home before dark. I mean, can you imagine parenting? Yeah. Today versus when we grew up and even in, even having our children, just the way technology has changed how we parent. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And now, so, so you have a, a little grandchild now yeah. uh, and that's Brianna's, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And are they close? Are they close by? Yeah, they're about 15 minutes away. So oh, we get to see that's... little Obadiah a lot. So we're oh, with Daya. Oh, how beautiful. And how old is he now? He's about four and a half months old. Oh, just getting to that fun, squishy, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he'll start moving around stage. What's that been like for you and your wife to, to play the role of grandparent versus parent and when to step in, when to not, you know, there's lots of things we have to learn as, yeah. as grandparents. Yeah. yeah. We definitely let uh, Brianna and Michael uh, take care of Obadiah and, be the parent, but <clears throat> it's really nice to be able to uh, just, you know, hang out with Obadiah and mm -hmm. then whenever he has a dirty diaper or whatever, you can just kind of, hey, <laughs> here you go. Yep, goes right back. Too, it? <laughs> I think we might be hungry. Yeah. So. <laughs> so you get all, the, <laughs> get all the fun parts without any of the responsibility. Uh, That's pretty interesting. It's the best. It's the best. And I bet all your siblings, his aunts and uncles are loving it too. Oh, yeah. 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 They oh, love, that's fun. And, and of course, Brianna's got a lot of good built in babysitters. Absolutely. That's right. And for, for the first year, she probably won't use that a whole lot. I found as a as a grandparent, the first year of the child's life, we don't get them, you know, we, we can like struggle to hold them and, and all of that. And, but then like something about when they first turn like one, one and a half, then all of a sudden they're like 
being dropped off at our door and they come with a suitcase when they come. It's a lot more of, of uh, a lot more grandparent time. Uh, so soak in that first year and then then it gets super, super fun after that. Looking forward to it. That's for sure. Yeah. So so outside of that, um, so kind of walk us through um, where do you so your work ethic, I assume, you know, came from, like you said, watching your father and just not knowing any other way. You didn't know you had a great work ethic, probably until somebody told you that. That's just I, I'm assuming I don't want to put words in your mouth, but walk us through where that did come from. And then where do you continue to feed that? Where do you get your motivation? What do you continually, how are you continually filling your cup? Because you have a lot of responsibilities, all your customers, all your team, your staff, um, and obviously all your family. Where do you continue to fill your cup to make sure that that you're there and 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 continue to to inspire and empower others? Yeah, so um, I know the, my family has always had a pretty strong work ethic. From my youngest years, when I was four or five years old, I would see my grandpa, who had just had a stroke, uh, at I think age fifty. Uh, he was, uh, you know, usually you see people figuring out how to walk again with a cane or, you know, some, you know, we have all kinds of new machines now that help people out. He was actually out in his garden with one of those metal three pronged plows, and so he, he just loved being out in the garden. He would shove that thing through and then drag his left foot you know and then shove it through again and drag his left foot until <laughs> that was his uh you know recovery mode so wow. he would be out there every time i came over just sweating yeah. and having a good time out in the garden working hard of course my dad's been always a hard worker and that seems to be inside of me too i'm mm -hmm. a big believer in everybody is called you know to do something with their life and you can feel it you know god has given people talents and uh, so you got to use those talents and figure out, you know, the best ways for you to use them. And so um, I think that the big thing that we have to do as humans is figure out uh, the things that we've been given and, and make a difference with them. Um, you know, if you make some money, you got to give back to the community and give back to your church and give back to people who would, you know, who are in hard times and need a leg up. Uh, just a little story about that, um, you know, the, how the Bible says that if you give, it'll be given back to you in a much greater measure. Well, when I was 18, I just felt like our youth pastor, who was about 25 at the time, who I thought was really old. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they were they were having a couple of kids and it just seemed like they needed a little extra. Well, I had an extra $200. So I just felt impressed to give him $200 one oh. day after church. The very next day on a Monday, you know, and this is me just getting going in the insurance business. I, I made a sale and made $600 or a couple of sales or whatever it was. And so I thought, okay, there really is something to- I get that. it, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I think that really, uh, you know, if you wanna know about me personally, my success, I really do owe, owe it to the Lord just with um, trying to give back to him. You can't outgive God. He definitely will increase your business, uh, increase whatever job a person has, whether it's in the insurance business or whatever. Um, you'll be blessed. And so I'm definitely blessed because, you know, because of him. Yeah. And, uh, and I know my wife would say the exact same thing. And so... Um, you know, we have to put in the hours, right? We have to put in the hard work, but, uh, definitely if you're striving to do, you know, to give back, to work with your talents and do the things you feel like you're called to do, mm -hmm. then it'll be returned back to you in a much greater measure than you ever put out. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, what a, I can't top that. So there's no way to. To top that, so uh, it's a great place for us to leave. I know everybody listening today, Jacob, who gets to see a little bit more of a piece of you and the human side uh, of that now, of, of what has driven you over these years and continues to drive you and continue to have more of an impact on just more and more and more people in your in your home, in your community, uh, and in this industry. So I appreciate you spending some time and being so open and sharing 
with us today and I uh, just can't thank you enough and look forward to seeing you soon. Yep. Thanks a lot right. for having me, Joanne. Absolutely. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.